My interest in the ocean was sparked early on by the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau, which aired in, on television in the 60s, and you really had, no one had ever seen anything like that, I think, before he had started doing those specials, and it was just like landing on the moon for, for me. So after college, I got a job at what was called the Orange County Marine Institute, and now is known as the Ocean Institute in Dana Point, California. Harry Helling, the director, asked me to do a comic book about tide pool ecology. And so I, I came up with this idea of doing this comic book called The Intertidal Zone. And it starred basically all these invertebrate sea creatures from the tide pools in Southern California, uh, such as the sea star, barnacles, shore crabs. And actually the host was a sponge named Bob but not like Spongebob, he was a, a, a natural looking sponge. I reached a point at the Marine Institute where I was more interested in creating things and painting and sculpting. I started using motors and parts from old toys and sort of cannibalized these things into sculptures. I have one right here. This one this is this dog that I made out of some motor from some toy. He actually barks a little bit. He's a little bit old right now, so he's sounding tired. I actually went up to CalArts and brought all my paintings with me. I had no animation experience and, uh, you know, no films. And I met with Jules Engel, who was the head of the experimental animation program there. And he looked at my work and, and said, you belong here, you know, immediately. And it, it totally changed my life. My thesis film, was called Wormholes, and that was funded by the Princess Grace Foundation. Wormholes was an attempt to uh, depict relativity in a poetic way. I was trying to present this kind of complex scientific idea in a way that was easy to understand. I had had a film accepted into the Ottawa Animation Festival, so I went to a screening of Wormholes, and uh, not only, I love the style, but it was extremely cerebral and. and the conceptual and, and warped. Joe Murray, who's uh, trying to put together the show Rocco's Modern Life, was looking for directors, which was a dream job for anybody that likes animation. We worked from outlines. So Rocco was storyboard driven, which is another thing that appealed to Steve. That style of writing was the way many of the earlier Warner Brothers cartoons were written and many others, probably Flesher, you know, these things where they didn't follow script. There was one in particular that, that had a story of, it was Undersea, actually, episode where fish are fishing for fishermen. And he came up with that. Working on the last season, I remember I was talking with writer Martin Olson about shows and, you know, uh, funny animal shows. And, and so I really thought, I don't really have an idea that I'd want to torture myself over for several seasons. And then Martin was looking at the intertidal comic that I had and he said, what are you crazy? This is your show right here. So I thought I'd like to do a show about an innocent, sort of like a Jerry Lewis under the sea kind of thing. I started to think, well, what undersea creature would represent this? And so I, I just started drawing undersea animals and, and I came across the sponge. It was really not very animated. They usually sit pretty quiet on rocks, filter feeding. but. It still seemed like a funny shape, so I started drawing these sponges, and, and then uh, it dawned on me that, uh, well, there was a sink sponge, so I drew a square one, and I, I it immediately locked on to the idea of this undersea nerd, and from that point on, I thought, well, that's the star, the SpongeBob. Two very important people in the genesis of the show SpongeBob were Derek Dryman, and Nick Jennings, who I, were companions from Rocco. He was, at the time, the creative director of the show. And so that's the first time we got to write together and, and work together. Steve called me up and said that he was putting this pitch together and he needed a little bit of a uh, couple of paintings to sort of lock in visually what's going on uh, for the background style. I actually hired those guys to come over to my house and uh, help me develop this pitch bible, which uh, is what most People, when they pitch a, an animated show, they come up with some kind of information about the design and the concept and story ideas. And so Derek and Nick came over, and I would basically work with Derek on the concepts, and then Nick 
On the other side was working on, on the art for the Pitch Bible. I paint much tighter, render a lot more than we ended up stylizing SpongeBob. And Steve's paintings were exactly the opposite. They were super loose, super rough, and really fun to look at and really colorful. It took a while for me to sort of get into that sort of idea of keeping looser and you know, getting as loose as possible. We couldn't just translate his style of painting right into animation. It was just a little too loose. I try not to walk in with, a, with, a, with an idea of my own to inject into, to try to force Steve into doing something. I try to wait and see what he's thinking and then I can react to that. Ultimately the day came when we had the, the I had this pitch bible, I had all the characters at least uh, thought, thought out and some storylines and uh, it was time to pitch the show. And he had on his Hawaiian shirt, he had this whole underwater terrarium with little models of the characters. He had artwork, he had Hawaiian music playing. Also I recorded a version of the theme song just with me singing into a tape recorder uh, and I implanted it into the shell so that when you lift it up, it, it plays the theme song. It was pretty amazing. We, uh, I'd say one of the cardinal rules when you're pitching is to just get people in the room to laugh, get their attention, get them excited. I guess I was just trying to do anything to make them think, this is weird, and let's take another meeting. I think one of the most amazing things about his initial pitch, after all the funny stuff, he had character descriptions and an overview of the world that it was so complete he knew who his characters were it was amazing and if you look back now all these years later it's all there in the original documents i love the idea that he was a marine biologist in a former life you know that he studied marine biology that was a big thing because it was like well who's going to know this world better than somebody that's actually interested in this world i was like let's just do it i don't know what this sponge is but let's do it they decided to give us money to write a storyboard and uh, you know let's see what happens with this. So we had two weeks to write the, the, uh, the pilot episode. And I came into the room and there up on the wall was these extraordinary storyboards everywhere. And Steve uh, and his team were there and they put on a performance which I wish I had on tape. He started to pitch the show and it was like, oh my God, this guy is good. You know, he is funny, he was doing all the voices, he was doing the sound effects. They were laughing, you know, went really well. And so it was, it was a little, it was stressful because we knew that that was, that was the decision. He acted out every character. He made voices and the other people came in and chimed in with their voices and he pointed to the boards and, and the kineticism of the boards itself, even in the action sequences where he goes, it bounces off here and off here and off here and bounces there and he goes here and he goes there and he slaps there. And every sound, you could almost hear every sound effect. So me and Steve and Nick were waiting in the room and they just walked out and it was like five minutes, you know. We were worried, we thought it would take weeks. The only reason after the pilot pitch that we took a few minutes to step outside is that we were exhausted from laughing and we really just had to calm down and <laughs> figure out the right way to, you know, to, to just tell him to go ahead because we were, uh, we wanted to have some modicum of control of the process. <laughs> Door opened and Albie walked in and he's like, okay, it was great, let's, let's do it. So after we finished the pilot, uh, they aired it to several people, and Nickelodeon and uh, test groups. So we got a green light to do 13 episodes. That's when the real work began, and that is to find a team to make this show. We put together slowly a, a, I, what I think was a, an incredible team. They, most of them, a lot of them were really young and new, new to this type of writing and had great, fresh ideas. and. Uh, so I attribute much of the success to SpongeBob to that collaboration.
we really use animation to its, its fullest extent. You know, we, you know, a lot of people aren't doing that these days. They're trying to keep it, you know, reality-based. This was a cartoon show. There's a time and a place for a script-driven show. There's a time and a place for a, uh, an artist-driven show. And I think SpongeBob works best because it's a cartoonist-driven show. And we got to do a lot of cartoon gags. You know, exploited animation as much as possible. I hated pitching. It was, ugh. So it was was an extra effort to to you know. I, oh, God, I have to draw and pitch. I would not let that thing in my house, even if it was body trained. You see that body. <laughs> and we'd have to pitch to you know the 40 uh, people in the crew. Uh, before that, it would be you know a sleepless night. You know, just tossing and turning because uh, I have a fear of crowds. But what would happen is uh, the next morning I would, you know, tons of sugar, lots of espresso, extra sugar, sugar in my Coca-Cola, run around the block and then get in there and just try to pitch and try not to look at all the faces. And we just go through it. And hopefully you get the laughs and they don't pick up on how nervous you are. The cut line, he turns it, turns it again and Patrick calls on. <laughs> Again, turns it upside down. Again, finally, it strikes it up. And here's. <laughs> SpongeBob was really fun for, like I said, the very reason that we could come up with a lot of gags in post production. We did a lot of Frankensteining on the show. Uh, we, we did a lot of uh, taking cannibalizing from different takes to come up with a line just so it sounded, you know, exactly the way they wanted it to. It was fun because it was sort of guerrilla animation, so we could just do things on the fly and add them in at the last minute if they're appropriate and, you know, made the show funnier. Scuba diving is one of my favorite things to do. I could take my uh, experiences underwater and, um, you know, think about the different sea life and, you know, use those things as color references. I was uh, snorkeling or scuba diving on vacations in locations where this kind of plant life existed in the ocean. I appreciated it so much more than in the past. I was going, well, hey, I, I draw that thing. There's that thing, and that's the way it really looks down here. Aaron Springer is a cartoon genius. God. And the hardest thing about working with Aaron is that he has about 20,000 ideas for every one idea that I have. Sherm hated when I used Sharpies because it would give him a headache. So, uh, but I think he secretly liked it. Life in a cubicle, it's sad. I think it's easy, don't you? Just sit down, have a bagel maybe, some coffee. Draw a few pictures, la 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 la. No, it's not that simple. But it was kind of fun because you have a lot of interaction with people around you. But the problem with that is when you want to get something done and you're trying to concentrate, it just doesn't happen. Personally, first season is my favorite season of, of all of them. I think that, um, you know, we weren't, we were just hitting our stride and you can see a lot more, I think, of the styles of the individual directors in the first season shows. I feel like personally Spongebob and Patrick are my children and every day I'd come to work and I'd have to dress them just like I would my kid in the morning. And um, that's just, you know, my favorite shows that I've ever worked on have been like that. You have a staff that's really there and on it 100% and they're, they're happy to be there, they're happy to be, they feel like they're all contributing to this great, you know, nucleus. The people on it were so much fun and, and, and they brought together so much. They brought together talent um, and, and, great, and a great sense of humor. SpongeBob was just one of those shows where the right elements and the right people were, were at the right place at the right time. Everybody 
bonded really well. Everyone got along great, and we were kind of like one big happy family. Those were good times. Good times. I can't take off my pants. Look, it's the haunted mattress. It's a gift. A gift from a friend. <laughs> Fudge Bob, I was so worried, I thought something terrible had happened. You must think I'm pretty dumb. <gasps> Nothing personal, lad. That's it. I'm moving out of this neighborhood. <laughs> take two, six, seven, seven, nine. <laughs> Maybe it's the way you're dressed. I'm not crying. I'm laughing. As far as casting goes, my approach was first have an idea in my head for each character before going to a casting director who would find some potential people for that role. So we basically found these people that uh, sounded, I guess, like the voice that I crudely could do for the characters. We really spent a lot of time and a lot of sessions just figuring out what his laugh would be, how he would sing, how he would cry. Steve spent a lot of time dialing SpongeBob in. I remember Tom, he was looking in the mirror and looking at himself and he said something like, oh, what's, what's a sponge with square pants and a tie thinking uh, that I could get a job at a fast food restaurant? One crying Johnny coming up! I thought about that name SquarePants and I thought that was really funny. It describes what SpongeBob is literally, but also I think it's his character. He's a starchy little square guy, well-meaning, clean-cut little nerd. We knew that we wanted SpongeBob to be a character of indeterminate age, much like Jerry Lewis, or physically very, very rubbery and insane, you know, kind of a man-child, but you can't really pin it down. He goes to school like a kid, but he has a job like a grown-up. Hall Monitor SpongeBob reporting for duty, ma'am. I'm ready to assume my position in the hall. You know, the character that Jerry Lewis played in those movies was very SpongeBobish in that his enthusiasm and desire to help people would often start a snowball rolling down the hill. Broken traffic light. Who's to say my monitor duties should end just because the bell rang? I can be helpful anywhere. This looks like a job for the whole monitor. <laughs> what would this town do without you, SpongeBob? Oh, my leg! Oh, my leg! The range where he was going to be, we knew that we wanted something really cartoony. But also, the munchkin -y. I remember thinking of the Munchkins, oh, the yellow brick road, as kind of a template. And then we kind of fine-tuned it from there so that it wasn't just a squeaky voice, so that there, were, that there were highs and lows, and there was a thing that he did where he, he was trying to be cool, and hey, baby, you know, and when he was scared, his voice would go up higher, and... SpongeBob is this kind of squeaky clean, small, impish character. And so I was looking for that sort of voice. There actually is a cassette tape that exists of me doing Spongebob and Steve Hillenburg doing Squidward. And that was, that was the first time that we ever spoke on tape as, as those characters. Hundreds of creatures swim through these doors every day in our undersea community, oh. depending on you to serve them nutritious, delicious, reasonably priced food in a clean, family-friendly oh. environment. Look! 
I've been standing around on my tentacles since 8 o'clock this morning, and I don't have the strength to listen to this. Who depends on you, you may ask? Well, let's just start with the A's. No. Aaron Anchovy. Ah. L.B. Albacore. Ah. We decided to give him kind of a dolphin-y laugh. Now, the way you achieve that dolphin-y laugh is, uh, first of all, you, you have to make a noise that your neighbors will find uh, most distressing, which is, Eeeh! like if somebody's, somebody's letting the air out of you and you're a balloon, Eeeh! and then you take your hand on your Adam's apple and go, Eeeh! <laughs> and then they give you money and your parents say, wow, uh, that's weird that <laughs> you can actually make a living doing that. Gwen Warner is this curmudgeon, snotty, aloof, a wannabe artist. In a way, Squidward is the guy I can identify with most because he's a lot like us. He looks at Spongebob, you know, he is crazy at times, and, and no one seems to notice except Squidward. It's a big, beautiful, old rock. Oh, the pioneers used to ride these babies for miles, and it's in great shape. Spongebob, will you forget the stupid pioneers? Have you ever noticed that there are none of them left? That's because they were lousy hitchhikers, ate coral, and took directions from algae. And now you're telling me they thought they could drive. Rocks? He's got a good heart. He just he covers it with his uh, curmudgeon shell. I knew it. Spongebob. You do oh. care. No, I don't. I do not. That was uh, just a uh, cover. I don't. Yes, you actually care for that thing? Squidward has this big honking nose, and he's a bit of a malcontent. And so I just put everything up in the nose and gave him the all police attitude, and, well, there it was. Hold on there, little square dude! Please! For Sandy Cheeks, I was looking for a strong female character that could be friends with SpongeBob but not a love interest. They really bang around and do karate together, kind of like stunt buddies. And so that gets him into trouble, creates some conflict in the way they challenge each other. So, what's your name? Sandy. Sandy's all about her mouth because of her huge teeth. So she's, uh, she's right here. She's right here at the front with her book teeth. And that's pretty much how I find Sandy. I have to go to the teeth. <laughs> Close it! There it is. What is it? Can't you see? Steve was funny because he sent me all this research on Texas and slang. We worked a lot with the pacing because as a squirrel I thought she should be really spastic and, and he thought she should be more reserved. <laughs> but I think we, you know, we found a happy medium. I'm not crying. I'm laughing. I appreciate what y'all are trying to do, SpongeBob, but home isn't about barbecues and pecan pies. Home is where you're surrounded by other critters that care about you. I was trying to think of a role model of somebody who was smart and from that part of our country, and, and the, um, the person that came to mind was, was Holly Hunter. And I don't actually know where she's from, but that sound, you know? So you stay? I'm staying! Welcome home, Sandy! Hey! Hey, who needs dumb old Texas anyway? What did you say? Patrick is so he's very, very low in base and, and not very quick. There it is, SpongeBob. The carnival is back in town. Finding the character was really about feeding off SpongeBob or goading SpongeBob. And... Hmm. I sense no danger here. How could they be dangerous? They're covered with free cheese. All I know is Mr. Krabs said, Patrick, don't do that. Cheesy. No danger here. Go on, try it. But Mr. Crab said... SpongeBob, let me ask you something. Does this look dangerous? Does this look dangerous? Does this look dangerous? When Patrick goes off, I thought of a couple of the great Shelly Winters performances. Shelly Winters Gone Bad. Boom, I mean, she's nuclear. Hard on stick, my stars! I kind of like to think of Patrick as having a little Shelly Winters in him. I don't think I look very much like Shelly Winters, and, but it's, it's more just how I feel. Mm. 
Krabs off to jail for you, Mr. Krabs. Patrick, you're fired. But I don't even work here. Would you like a job starting now? Boy, would I. You're fired. Mr. Krabs is probably the only adult with the exception of Mrs. Puff in Bikini Bottom. Steve actually can take credit for the laugh. He wanted something different than a typical pirate laugh, but still a pirate laugh. I went in, I, 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 and he said, no, do it faster. I, 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 do it faster. I, 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 do it faster. I, 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 Plankton's voice I read for as Spongebob. So I actually did all the lines Spongebob had in the pilot, but with Plankton's voice. And um, so he was saying stuff like, I'm ready, I'm ready. Hey, Gary, it's a beautiful day. Hear me, Krabs. When I discover your formula for Krabby Patties, I'll run you out of business. I went the cool thing about him is he's got two sides of his voice, which are one is, you know, his uh, sort of... <laughs> But then he can go to the good side, which is... I feel all tingly inside. Should we stop? No, that's how you're supposed to feel. Well, I like it. Let's do it again! Okay! F is for frolic through all the flowers. U is for you, N is for nose picking, sharing gum and sun licking here with my best buddy. We've done some personal appearances and... Little boys always come up and they, they, they want an autograph and they slide over the, you know, their paper to you and they say, Plankton's always mean. And, and, you, and you feel this like energy of, of they completely love it. You know, completely, it's like, he's mean all the time, I love it. And, and, and you're just, it's funny because you could see, it's the same thing I would have connected with as a kid. All knees will bow to Plankton. Free Krabby Patties! Hey, look at that! The incidental voices uh, can be anything in the show that, that is not what they call the principal voices, which are the main recurring roles in, in a show. Um, they are the little boy, the guy ordering a Krabby Patty. It's something different every show. I play incidental characters on SpongeBob SquarePants. The Halloween episode, I played a little girl fish who was making fun of SpongeBob. And in the Christmas episode, I played a little girl fish who um, had lost their two front teeth. So I kind of move around here and there. What is an incidental voice? Well, to me it is being at a wedding and telling a group of kids that you're not the voice of Sandy, but that you are on SpongeBob, and uh, that you're just fish number 83, the occasional teen girl that's, oh, SpongeBob! It's different every show. It's like, you know, boy number two, or, you know, eel number 76, or, or thought bubble number seven. Sometimes I do like a little kid voice. Or, or an old person's voice like that, or... or <laughs> Monsters. Hello, Often I'm a copfish. Son, we're looking for the maniac. Have you seen this man? <laughs> we usually have a great time during the records, which I think has a big influence on what you actually grab out of that. I think that everybody really was suited. We always have the opportunity out there to do as best we can. And, and, and as an actor, we all appreciate that from Steve. They're all just really great people to be with and people that I'm learning from all the time. I mean, astounded by some of the voiceover artists that come in there. It's like, I just need to step down because these are the masters. It sounds stupid to talk about cartoons, cartoons this way, but, but you know, really, Tom and Bill and Carolyn and Roger as Squidward, for sure, 
They're not really in the room. The real people aren't really in the room for a few hours. It's bikini bottom, you know, very much like channeling. It's a, it's a very Shirley MacLaine kind of a thing where for four hours you're this sponge. My name is John Seymour and I draw the backgrounds for Spongebob Squarepants, one of the three layout artists that, uh, that draw the backgrounds for the show and the voices and the story and the storyboard is done before we even get it. There are prop designers which do small objects that will animate, like this hat. These hands are going to clap together. This is the list of the drawings that I have to do for this show. It's really tiny because he shot it down so we could put all the notes from the breakdown on the same page. Basically, what I'm doing here is uh, taking scenes from the storyboard and drawing them out in detail so that the painters can go ahead and paint them and then the characters can be put on top of those and they can animate the whole thing. Well, first of all, I'll have to put the field guide on here. I usually work with the 10 field, but this represents the ratio of your television screen. So we draw within this. As I start with the blue pencil, because that way you don't really have to do a rough first. You can kind of do the rough in the blue real light. It just shows you where the line's gonna occur. And put some hills back here. When you're in Goo Lagoon, all it is is sand and goo, the waves which are going to animate, these would actually be on another level and they'd be in red. And this is something that we do a lot of on this show, the bamboo posts in the ground. And it's going over a hill. Got to finish it off by showing what sort of terrain it is. This is sand. So I'm going to do some little sand indications. And of course the clouds. This is the Goo Lagoon. I would write down what it said down here. I would actually put the, uh, the series that we're in, the show number, the scene number, and then the name of this particular layout down here. That's a layout. That's the way it works. <laughs>